moderator. I'm very happy to welcome you today for our talk given by Rich Colton. Before I introduce him properly, I would like to acknowledge our past president that just recently finished his term, Peter Engelman, who served for seven years. Thank you very much. He's done a lot of the project and the, the, fa the face, not the face, but the website you see when you go online and look for our historical society is Peter's creation mostly, and you're still working on it, adding uh, things to the catalog all the time. So we are very fortunate to have him, and he's not leaving. <laughs> he's still with us. Um, and now I'm going to introduce our speaker, Rich Halton, who was also a president of a historical society and uh, beat Peter's record by a few years. And uh, Rich was also a president, a chairman of the historical commission in Montague. Is yes. that right? Um, so he, um, he was at UMass from 1977 to 2000. How many years is that? I was working mostly. I didn't take that long to get my master's. I, I, I had two masters, uh, but that was uh, it took. Not, yeah, you know, not, that not long. studying. That was only at the end. Working, um, developing <coughs> historic programming for for the National Park Service, and so he got his master's at 2000, and he went on to Springfield Armory. So Rich studies uh, early firearms, and my English, from what I got from our few conversations, artillery is really his uh, love of fashion. Am I right? Oh, well, it's part of it. Mostly as a museum person. Uh, I work in at Springfield Armory. It's an industrial site. So I'm primarily an industrial historian. And uh, my focus was uh, the U.S. government's role in that industrial development, which is often oversighted. And it at first uh, realized itself with the uh, National Armory starting in 1782. And as an artillery, that's the first place artillery was manufactured for the U.S. Army. And uh, then the muskets came in uh, within a decade or so after that, and they were simultaneously, and the muskets became the main operation right up through the Vietnam War. Yeah. So, and so, there we go. From and the pi it, it pioneered it interchangeable through, manufacturing. Yeah. That was, that's its particular claim to fame. And, you, and uh, we'll maybe touch upon that later on in our discussion. See why I think his passion is industrial artillery and big scale stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Today we're going down to a very small scale. We're looking at <coughs> one single musket that's here um, on this table. And we'll learn about it, a little bit uh, about its owner, um, but mostly about musket as a, as a piece that uh, served uh, in the Revolutionary War. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to um, venture uh, to take you, actually we keep the line for just a moment. Yep. Um, I don't know if you know anything about the history of the particular piece that you have in your collection. It, uh, it's, you do see them around, but uh, it's very rare that they are in fact connected to people in your community, this specific individual one. Doesn't look like much now, it's uh, this here. It's, uh, well, if you were this old, you know, you, you'd look worse. But it's, uh, you know, it's uh, browned because from rust, the wood's been beat up, it's seen a lot of use. Has the initials of the owner at the time, J.H., Jason Hassel. It looks like an I, but that's how you often had the J's at that time. And the gun itself is uh, a French musket. Uh, model 1768. And this was the 1760s for the French, were a period when they decided to drastically remodel their small arms for their army. And they had the largest army in Europe. Uh, by the American War of Independence, this was the older gun, surplus gun, and they wanted to make way for the new style, which was so advanced that in fact it became the basis for a lot of other nations in the 19th century, and the same gun, basically. Uh, but that's a, that's a later model, quite a bit more advanced. So it, this was a very convenient situation 
for the French to have the American colonies rebelling against the mother country. Uh, the French could get in there and kind of pay back for the embarrassment uh -huh. of the uh, previous decade and a half earlier. <laughs> And uh, it's a very similar situation to what you're experiencing now with Ukraine and such like that. Other nations send in such alliances are made. Uh, when the Israeli state was first established, they got a bunch of old guns that were obsolete. And you get this continually through uh, uh, the process. So this comes in, I'll give you just a basic big picture. Starting in 1777, Springfield Arsenal is established. It's the foundational establishment for what becomes Springfield Armory. And the French funnel their small arms and artillery through there. And it's a critical thing they did because as Nathaniel Green, of Rhode Island General Nathaniel Green, was panicking that summer of 1777 that, you know, we're running out of everything. We're not going to make it, uh, General Washington. This is it. He's on the Delaware. And within a short time, he's writing, there's all these French ships coming up to Delaware. They're loaded with cases of muskets. There's artillery. Um, this has possibilities. <laughs> and that we figure today that approximately 160,000 of these muskets wow. were in the hands of the uh, uh, Continental Army. As uh, this one, we will show you that the narrative for Jason Hassel is, particularly in 1778, his unit in New Hampshire, which is where the family came from before you have their links in the Conway, uh, that they, um, they're, they're getting these, mostly through Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And all that's coming, and Newport, Rhode Island, that's coming right into, and then being shipped to Springfield. And uh, it's, uh, has anybody ever fired reproduction or real one? Not again. It's not too late. You know, it's <laughs> well, you will learn how to fire them now with this video. Uh, this is about a 15-minute video from my friends, uh, Jim Hollister and uh, the new guy, Jared, uh, which uh, will try to draw you back into images which hopefully will stick with you uh, that, so that you'll have the sound, the image. Uh, it will go over some of the technology and uh, everything but the smell. Uh, the smell of the gunpowder, that white smoke, it's got a lot of sulfur in it. It's, yeah. yeah, so be it. Uh, but that's, uh, originally this would have been polished iron. The French did that. The British tend to do brass. Uh, this is from Minuteman National Historical Park. Uh, so they're focused on the events of one day, one year, April 19, 1775. And you'll see they'll be using a British-style musket, which we will talk about later on, because it actually works into our story. And uh, so he'll go over it, and then, then Jared will take over. And uh, so this original, the original piece is uh, approximately, if you use it, anybody here, you ever use a shotgun? Yeah. Basically, it's a shotgun, OK? Cylinder bore, so to speak. And let's see, I think I had. Oh, yeah, I do have a ball. Mm -hmm. He'll go over it, too. So it's main projectile, although it's whatever goes down will come up. It's a muzzle loader. Uh, it's, in this case, it's going to be uh, lit like a lead gumball, about 5 eighths of an inch across. And it is dropped on the powder charge. The powder charge and the ball all get there by a paper cartridge, which is like a penny roll. It has the ball at one end tied off about a tablespoon of powder, and it's long enough so it's folded over and it's put into a box, often with holes in it, so you don't have to think about it, you don't have to look at it, you just reach back, find one, and you bring it up. And you will see what they'll do is they will use their teeth, and they put a little bit of gunpowder on the spoon shape here, which is opposite the hole that goes into the inside of the barrel where most of the powder will be deposited. Uh, this is called a battery. It's a striking steel. It imitates, it's going to imitate with the flint lock, with the flint itself held in this rotating vise called the flint cock, because of the action of a rooster. Everybody knows a rooster would peck like that. And uh, it will slide down the face of this, knock it off, so the powder will be exposed. And it's like when you're striking sparks with flint and steel. It just mimics it, but it's mechanical. 
and hopefully the sparks will get onto that powder, flash through the hole, and light the main charge off. The, uh, when you are loading it, as you will see, you will take that cart paper cartridge, your thumb over where you just bit off, and you pour the rest of it down. Take that underside, the ball is undersized, and uh, it's about a 6.63, 0.64 inches to a 0.69 barrel, about six hundredths of an inch difference. About the thickness of the paper. Stuff the, then the paper and ball in all together, and you shove it down with the ramrod. And that's it. It's really simple. You know, you don't know where the world's going. You might want to know this, you know. <laughs> I, I had the experience when I first came out here. I'm a, I'm a Boston kid. I grew up in Charlestown and then Boston. Of course, you'd never know that to listen to me. But it's, uh, it's hard to get away from that. But when I came out here uh, in my mid-20s, I was... Uh, about six years of active duty in the Navy, and I was out. I was going to get myself back to college, came to UMass, and I had friends up in um, Chalamont, the Tower family, big old family there, big old house. And, uh, and my friends there, some, some other young men, uh, they, they had a, a flintlock musket there, but it was converted to percussion. Very simple system. About the Civil War, all this pivoting flint stuff is taken off, and they replace it with a simple hammer. This is a French one from that kind of musket there, from this kind of musket. Simplifies it. And so we sat on the back stoop, blowing away tin cans. <laughs> you know, filling the house with acrid black, acrid white smoke. And one of the field hands came in. He just turned 90. He went from eight hours to four hours. And he's been in his bib overalls, he's classic. And he looks at it, he looks at us, and he says, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> And then he describes how in the Great Depression, that was the gun that he used as a young man because of the expense of cartridges and modern weapons, like lever action, Winchesters and all. They took that gun off the wall and they used it for deer hunting, rabbit hunting, helped to feed the family. And I found that in a number of cases throughout the valley uh, where his, someone here has actually used it or maybe what it was designed for. And it was, uh, that was very interesting. And then he took a few shots. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah, so, so I'm glad I was here early enough to be able to meet him and to make those connections. But that started me thinking about the connections of what these represent, the people who experienced them in their time. Which as an historian, I'm not a, not a collector. I'm interested in these as pathways, as windows to understand to recover the meaning of these objects in the time that they were used, the meaning of events that, they, that those people experienced and such. So there we go. So any other questions on this? It, uh, specifically, uh, most of the questions will be answered here. And when this is done, you will be uh, probably a bit more ready to take it up if you have to sometime. There we go. Okay. Uh, I will start this. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Minuteman National Historical Park. My name is Park Ranger Jim Hollister, and today I am joined by my colleague, Jared Foose, also a park ranger here at Minuteman National Historical Park. And today we are going to be talking about the musket. So this musket is a flintlock musket. Now this particular one is a replica of a British military musket known as the King's Arm, also sometimes known as Brown Bess. It was the standard weapon in the British Army and also saw some service with the Massachusetts militia at the beginning of the war. Now when I say it is a flintlock musket, what I mean is that it is fired by means of a sharpened piece of flint striking against a hardened piece of steel. And when they strike together, that creates sparks. Those sparks would fall down into the flash pan, which contains a small amount of gunpowder called the priming charge. When the sparks hit the priming charge, it flashes or explodes, and the flames from that small explosion get drawn through a hole in the side of the barrel called the vent or touch hole, and that ignites a much larger amount of gunpowder inside the barrel. And when that explodes, it creates a lot of pressure in this little confined space, and that is what propels the ball out. 
Now, when I say a musket, uh, what I'm talking about is a smooth bore weapon. So that means the area inside the barrel is smooth, like a drain pipe. Um, and the ball that you load with is smaller than the diameter of the bore. So this particular bore is 0.75 inches or 75 caliber, and you would load it with a ball that was 68 caliber. Um, what you're doing is you're trading accuracy for speed. You could probably get more accuracy out of a weapon like this with a tighter fitting ball. However, in combat, speed counts. So a trained soldier could load and fire this weapon three times in a minute. That means you have to have this weapon ready to fire within 20 seconds. Now, of course, you load it through the muzzle. That's why you have a loose fitting ball. You put in your powder, your ball, fit a paper on top, draw your ramrod, ram it home just as easy as that after priming and then you're ready to fire so again within 20 seconds now when you do fire that shot the bullet comes rattling out leaves the muzzle at about 700 miles an hour wobbling like a knuckleball you could kill somebody at 300 yards problem is you really have no chance of hitting them deliberately maybe by accident most battles uh, were fought within a hundred yards the way these weapons were used in combat and the way soldiers were trained was to stand in lines, shoulder to shoulder, front rank, center rank, rear rank, letting the enemy get within 100 yards. And then they would start firing what's called volley fire. So you'd have your whole company of 50 men fire or two companies together called a grand division firing. And you're alternating your fire all along the line sending pockets of concentrated fire downfield every couple of seconds, smashing into the ranks of the oncoming enemy. So when you think about using the weapon like that in concert with other soldiers firing together, somebody's bound to hit something, and this weapon is particularly deadly. Now along the battle road here on April 19th of 1775, that didn't happen very much. The British Army was moving down the road very quickly, and Minutemen were running through these fields, firing at individual targets. So they kept the fire going all day long and constantly bringing in reinforcements. It was the right thing to do for the situation, but that's not how the musket is properly used. And we figure probably about one hit for every 300 shots. Think about the Battle of Bunker Hill less than two months later, the famous quote, don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. We have a lot of the same people like John Hartwell who lived here at the Hartwell Tavern at Bunker Hill. And what that means, they're letting the enemy get close and they're firing at close range together. That's how the weapon is supposed to be used and both sides certainly were well trained in those tactics. All right, now that we've heard a little bit from Ranger Jim about how these muskets worked, now it's the time to talk about how they were used on the field and how the soldiers knew how to use them. One of the myths of the American Revolution, of the battles of Lexington and Concord specifically, are that the militia soldiers that are out here fighting on April 19, 1775 were untrained. They were men that just stepped out from the farm fields, from their plows, and went off to fight the British Army. Couldn't be farther from the truth. In fact, almost all of the soldiers, the militia soldiers, the regulars, everyone that's out here has been trained extensively throughout the course of their lives in the use of these weapons, particularly, and they specifically set drill manual. And the reason that they need to know how to use these weapons in a specific type of way, why they're using drill manuals, is first of all because they need to be effective on the battlefield. Like Ranger Jim said, these soldiers, these militiamen, are lining up shoulder to shoulder, many, many soldiers down either direction, and they have to be able to operate in a small amount of space. So if you can imagine while you're loading and firing one of these muskets, it might be easy to throw elbows out there, to move your musket around that would be problematic on the battlefield, not just because you'd be hitting soldiers next to you, but because it would also slow down your rate of fire. As we talked about, a well-trained soldier could fire up to three shots in a minute with one of these muskets. And it is a long, lengthy process that they had to perfect through hours and hours of drill. Each of the soldiers would have learned different ways to hold their muskets, different ways to handle the guns while they're standing in those ranks. Not only this, they would have also learned how to march. 
That way, as they're moving across open sections of ground, or even if they're moving through trees or over fences or farm fields, they know how to keep that unit cohesion together so that they are more effective warriors on the field itself. Now, one of the other things to consider with one of these muskets per se is the length of the musket. When we see these, we often think, wow, that is a long, long gun, almost up to my shoulder height. The reason for that being is because when militia soldiers and regulars fought in, in battles, they were often not just lined up shoulder to shoulder, but in ranks deep, which meant you would have had another soldier standing directly behind you. By law, these militiamen here on April 19th were required to have a weapon that was over three and a half feet in length at the barrel. The reason being is because when they're aiming the musket, they need that barrel to go over the shoulder of the person standing in front of them. You don't want a short barrel because then you'll have the gun going off right in their face, but you also don't want to be able to snap the flint right in the side of their head as well. So you want their head directly in between right in the sweet spot where they're not going to be injured by your own soldiers while you're in the field. All right, so now that we've talked a little bit about how the musket is used on the battlefield, next we have to talk about the other side of that story. What happens when you are firing one of these muskets at an enemy downrange? What I have in my hand right here, if you can see it, is a musket ball that is the equivalent size of what would have been used here on April 19th, 1775 by both sides, militia and regulars. This is a soft lead musket ball. And the thing about this is that these are incredibly devastating to the human body on the field. We have countless accounts of what happened to the wounded that were left strewn along the battle road here in the vicinity of the Hartwell Tavern where we're standing at after the day's fighting. And the thing to consider with these soft lead musket balls is that they're soft, which means when it strikes something, they have a tendency to flatten out. As an example of what can be done, the damage done by one of these balls, you can see we have our board of education here that has some holes in it in the front. You can see the size of the musket ball entering the side of the board. The problem though being is that once it goes inside the board, it's going to flatten out. It's going to start bouncing around. These aren't high powered weapons like we have today. These are low velocity guns, which means when they come out the other side, they are devastating. You can see the size of the damage done by just one of these musket balls passing through this board here. And you can imagine what that would do to the human body. We have countless accounts of soldiers along the battle road that are wounded during the course of the fighting. One such occurrence takes place on the other side of the battle road, a place called Fisk Hill. There at the base of the hill lived a woman named Rebecca Fisk. On the evening of April 19, 1775, Rebecca comes back to her home after the fighting has concluded to find three horribly wounded soldiers lying in her front parlor. She talks about those soldiers wallowing in a puddle of their own blood caused by the devastating effect of one of these musket balls. One of those soldiers had even had his jaw taken away by one of those balls. He was very fortunate though because he lived from his wound. One of Rebecca Fick's in-laws, a doctor from the area, would actually come to that house after the fighting, traversing up and down the battle road, taking care of the wounded soldiers that they came across. In Rebecca Fist's house, the doctor came to dress the wounds of the king's soldiers left there, talking about extracting musket balls from the wounds of those men. However, a number of them did not survive. They perished and were thus later buried along the battle road trail. And these are scenes that repeat themselves over and over and over again. For many of the soldiers that are wounded here on April 19, 1775, this is just the beginning of a lifelong battle that they were faced caused by this small piece of lead fired out the barrel of a gun here one day in April. All right, so now we're actually gonna go through the process of loading and firing one of these muskets according to the 1764 manual exercise. Prepare to prime and load. Handle cartridge. Prime. Shut pan. Cast about. Charge with cartridge. 
Draw, rammer. Ram down, cartridge. Return, rammer. Shoulder, firelocks. Make ready. Present. Fire. Half cock, fire lock. Shoulder, fire lock. Shut, pan. As you can imagine, in battle, giving each one of those commands would be time consuming and cumbersome. In a combat situation, the officers would simply yell, prime and load, or the order would be given by a drum signal, and the soldiers would do so on their own. Once they've finished loading, they come back to this position, the shoulder, and that signals the officer that the men are loaded and ready to receive the commands to fire. And then he would give them the commands and then yell prime and load, and they would do it all over again. Jared and I are right now going to demonstrate for you how they would handle these weapons in a combat situation. I'm gonna yell prime and load, and Jared's gonna load on his own, and then I'll give him the firing commands. Again, the goal was three shots in a minute. We're gonna do the best we can. However, we're not going to hurry because safety first. Make ready. Present. Prime and load. Make ready. Present. Prime and load. Make ready. Present. Fire. Half cock. Fire lock. Shoulder. Fire lock. Secure. Fire lock. Shoulder. Fire lock. Shut. Pan. You may have noticed as Jared was firing repeatedly, the smoke that would build up, that's from one gun. So imagine a regiment in battle, 500 muskets being loaded and fired as quickly as the soldiers can. The smoke would very quickly obscure the battlefield, which also cuts down on the range at which you could damage your enemy because beyond 100 yards, you may not be sure who's out there because you have a very difficult time seeing them and identifying them properly. And another thing that happens, as you continue to fire, your flint gets worn out. It becomes dull. It's not going to produce the spark that you need. So it's going to reduce the reliability of the weapon. And also, not all the powder goes off. A lot of it stays behind as this thick, oily sludge called fouling. And that's going to get all over the lock and inside the barrel, which is also going to decrease reliability. And it's going to slow you down because the balls are going to get harder to push down the barrel because of all that fouling constricting the bore. So there are a lot of factors. In addition, the men are getting tired. Imagine constantly repeating, going through this manual of loading and firing time after time after time, the soldiers are going to get tired. Now there's another limiting factor, which we will demonstrate for you now. Make ready. Present. Fire! Prime and load!
half cock, fire lock. Shoulder, fire lock. Secure, fire lock. Shoulder, fire lock. Shut, pan. So one of the limiting factors as you're continuing to fire is that you have a small explosion going on inside this barrel. It's going to heat up. So for example, Jared, how does that barrel feel right now? It is incredibly hot to the point that I can't even touch the barrel. It becomes difficult to grip the musket when I'm actually trying to load it. And I think we had taken the temperature of this once before and it had been upwards of 113 plus degrees just after a few shots out of one of these muskets. So as you can see, using the musket in battle required teamwork, training, and trust. Now the Minutemen would have known each other in civilian life, and they would have built those relationships over many years. And on April 19th of 1775, those relationships were put to the ultimate test on that day and throughout the long conflict that ensued. So that's all we have for you today, and as always, thank you for watching. I hope that I hope that gave you a, a bit of the background technology. Before I come in, and you can put the PowerPoint on, get it ready. I wanted to uh, point out a few of the technical things with the um, the piece in the collection here. And um, let me also get my um, phone here. Now we're going to get into the history, as it's known by the association, the narrative here. Uh, this is uh, Jenny, she wrote this to me, I guess Hassel, a descendant in the Hassel. And um, she knows that her uncle Stanley Hassel, her father's brother, gave the musket to his son Johnny, my cousin, and John gave it to me. I loaned it to Connecticut uh, Conway Historical Society as I felt this was the right place for it. Jason Hassel was born December 4th, 1748, and died in 1799. In the Revolution, he served in Captain Joseph Moore's company of Colonel William Prescott's regiment at Bunker Hill and the Siege of Boston, 1775. In 1778, he was a corporal in Captain Peter Cross's company of Colonel Moses Nichols' regiment, which marched to Rhode Island. So the gun comes to us. It's marked on it, J.H. on the butt, scratched in. And Jenny can confirm because she's right there. Yeah. Well, thank you. I love, I love the fact that it's rooted here. This is not just a piece. It's this part of, it, it has come down to this point, this moment. And uh, so then his son Benjamin, 1791, lived in Maine, died in Conway, 1880. And his son Gilman, born in Maine, 1830, died in Conway, 1897. And his son Stanley, Jenny's uncle, uh, born in Conway, 1902, died in Connecticut. His son, John, your cousin, is still living in Florida, gave you the musket. The musket was passed down each generation, and now it belongs to you and the Conway Historical Society. And that helps amaz uh, wonderfully so. So there's, there's a lot that all of this has been witnessed to. I hope that helped a little bit. Uh, I, was, I would go to with Jim and Jared every year, I was as their historical weapons safety officer. So I would be in early, early duds and I would inspect everybody like that. So make sure they're right. So uh, I need one person. If uh, Tom, could you hold this? Sure. Okay, you can just hold it up to the audience, okay? Just uh, to the audience, face them. Now, I just wanted to make the point that I have that that weapon originally would have looked more like this. This is a Springfield, uh, what they call a Charleville pattern. This one is called sometimes a Charleville. Charleville was an arsenal, it's marked on the lock. You'll see some of the slide, the pictures that I'll show you. So there were so many of them made in Charleville, the Charleville arsenal in France, that they were often nicknamed Charlevilles. So when the US adopted in 1794, what sort of musket are you going to make with all of these in storage? And it's a, it was an efficient musket, well made. We just decided to copy it. So much, so much for originality. 
Or oh, the French were, the French had other things going on in the 1790s, so they don't worry about that. And the, so it was originally would have been polished. This one's an original Springfield, uh, War of 1812 period, but you can see it's basically the same musket. The metal was polished, the bands, the lock, uh, all the pieces that are iron and rusted on that would have been bright. Um, and, of course, then there's your ramrod. But otherwise, it's the same, same basic gun. Uh, as a military piece, thank you, Tom. We'll take, now, with, we don't have the bayonet for this, but we have the bayonet for this, and the bayonet would have been very similar. Uh, distinguishes it as a military piece, a hunting piece. You would probably have it, the wood going up to the muzzle, but this is the, yeah. So that makes it now a military piece. It's always loaded. This is what I always pointed out to the reenactors. I said, I said, you may, this may you say it's not loaded, but this is always loaded. So, and um, so I would have had a very similar one. Uh, the French designed this so that it could be easily field stripped. You had three iron barrel bands with the little springs here that go through holes. Take out the ram right here, Tom. Uh, just like you, you press it here, off it comes. Do the same thing with the next one, next one. Undo the screw at the tang, and you now can take the barrel out, clean it. Uh, make sure everything is just right and fine for you. Give that back to me. It made the gun also strong. Look at those bands and light. The French were the masters uh, of military technology in that period. Uh, the, the British, and we are fortunate, thank you, Peter, we are fortunate to have the kind of weapon which the narrative of Jason Hassel points out that when he was at Bunker Hill and Siege of Boston, he would not have had one of these French guns. They were not here. He would have had very likely a British musket or a copy thereof, possibly a civilian fowler. We have uh, in Peter Thomas's family come down, his, within his family, is this British musket, which uh, the narrative for this, it was picked up on the retreat from Lexington. So it's a British pattern 1768 musket, shoots a slightly larger ball, doesn't matter, puts a big enough hole in it, French on this. And you can see it's brass mounted. It's a gorgeous piece, but it's connected very differently. They are little tenons coming off the barrel underneath about three or four, and they have pins that are drilled through, and it's not intended to take the barrel off. When, you, when a soldier handles this, the barrel stays in the wood and they clean the whole thing. They wax it up so that it helps seal the wood and the metal fit. But it's, um, this is a model which basically was unchanged from the pattern 1730, right up through the Napoleonic War. It's got a little shorter on the barrel and, and such like this, but this is basically what you have. Any questions on that? See, this still has its original military finish. So, if, yeah. even though they knew that it got really hot, you know, they didn't try to modify in some way to... Oh, hot? You know, but after so many shots and oh. firings, well, the yeah. barrel got so hot it was hard yeah, to... Yeah, well, you hold the wood. <laughs> you're, you're a soldier in ranks. You're not. You got other things to. Think well, about. no, no, no. I meant in the in later. I say went forward oh, in the model design. Um, no, no, no change. Tactics were very much the same. You know, basically, what you're looking at tactically. Not bef um, before I get into this, you will see. I just want to point out to you. Uh, this uh, you're looking at masses of lead projectiles going down. Someone's going to get hurt. That's the idea. And, and the British pattern tended to be get up real close. Then you have higher casualty in the enemy. And if you can, fall on them with the bayonet and the butt plate. That part. Uh, I've seen the archaeology from uh, some of the French and Indian War and uh, what, Boscoines, that ship. And you find a lot of these were broken here as they were use as clubs. It's something that the French complained about, though. The British still kept doing it. <laughs> they did. The French actually complained about that. They said it was, you know, because these muskets are, are heavier. This part here, that 
tang isn't just decorative, that's intended. So this is the point of contact for you, someone else's skull. That's the idea. So it actually, there's a lot of thought gone into it. Yeah, I really like this piece. So I'll talk to you later about that. But I'm so glad to have the example so you can see this is what Jason Hassel probably would have seen more of early in the war. I did fire that one years ago. You did? Yeah. Except I was idiotic enough to put high grade nitro powder in. <laughs> <laughs> so you pro so you so that proof we should put another P there for the beside the next one there for the P for proof. I a pistol team. So I took it down to the range at, at UMass and I put it on a table and there was no ball in it. But uh -huh. I used Kleenex yeah. as a wad and put nitro powder in it. And so then I put powder in the flash pan and had a long wick. And I had the guy standing behind me saying, little to your right, little to your left. <laughs> I finally hit the flash pan. The thing went off. The entire range was full of smoke. And then filtering down was all this little Kleenex. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you have to realize. So last time I fired. And you have to realize putting modern powder in there, yeah. that's a good thing it didn't have a projectile. Because that's so, the high pressure is so high at that point. Uh, you might have 10,000 PSI pounds per square inch with this kind of with the normal old fashioned powder, the smoky stuff. You, you could have 40,000 PSI, 50,000 with modern powder. Yeah, so they can be, they've been known to go, but the good thing was just a Kleenex and it's a strong barrel, British proofed. Yeah, so uh, any questions on this, by the way? So I hope we gave you a visually the difference between them. Part of the French one before now, I get into slides. I'll just point out that the French were in a process of um, modernization and they were in a struggle to, for interchangeable manufacture. This particular lock here, which has been upgraded in the period of our Civil War to flint gone so that it has a hammer, but otherwise it's also a French lock from that same kind of musket. It's a different arsenal, it's Saint-Étienne, down in the south of France. And the other, third arsenal was Maubeuge. Those three were making this. Starting in the 1760s, when, and this gun is a premier example, the French decided we're going to try to make these guns interchangeable. So that one from Maubeuge, one from Saint-Étienne, one from Charleville will all fit each other. So they first did artillery so that by the 1770s, they were down to about four different kinds of field pieces, all fully interchangeable, carriages fully interchangeable. The British had nothing like this. Every little one was different, they needed. But the so the French started into that. Uh, it was led, first of all, General Gubervo, who had Henri Blanc at Saint-Artienne. This one is marked HB here for Henri Blanc. Henri Blanc in the 1780s meets Thomas Jefferson, who was emissary to, from the United States to France. And he takes Thomas Jefferson around, shows him. And Thomas Jefferson points out that there's a bin here of Sears, there's a bin here of tumblers, springs. They all fit. It doesn't matter. You can take one interchangeably. So, and he's very excited by that. And that's what Springfield Armory tries to do. Ten years later, it takes a while to get there. But the French... Uh, have it all, already down by the, 17, by the late 1770s. So they're truly pioneers. They're the ones who invent the jacquard loom, the first practical metal cutting lathe in the 1750s, all of this. So you, here we go. Anybody, uh, I'll pass that around. The, the, the interior of this is all original, but if you pull it, I'll pull it back to the half cock, you can see the HB, the, the H, leg of the H and the H and the B are side by side, but Blanc would actually stamp that because he was, he was a, such a. You may have mentioned this, but I didn't hear it. Did you say what caliber? The 69 caliber, yeah. 0.69 inches. Yeah, but the ball is about 0 0.63, 0 0.64. Just like the uh, 0 0.75 to 0.8 of the British one, the ball is going to be about 0 0.69 or 0 0.7. And, um, but the 0.64 is a big enough hole. It'll, it'll hurt. So that's, uh, let's then, any questions? I'll pass on a few other little things. These are other pieces I have. These are uh, trigger guard. Yeah, let me just pass them around. This is a front end. This is what, you know, they've gotten rusty, but they're made of iron. There you go. 
just as long as I get these four pieces back. This is uh, the sling swivel on the trigger guard. The, you can see it's all bent up from the sling, the belt pulling on it. But uh, that would be that. These things show up at tag sales. <laughs> Honestly, I'm not kidding you. Did, that give, did the French musket give Napoleon an advantage? Yes. Absolutely, yeah. It gave him an advantage because the gun is lighter, deadly, as deadly as the British one. Not quite as hard hitting, but um, yeah. Also the artillery, the French artillery was superior. It was the uh, field pieces were lighter, more uniform. Uh, but uh, the, the, uh, my uh, scholarly friend, uh, Merritt Rose Smith at MIT, who studied all of this, pointed out to me uh, from studies his grad students had done that the Napoleonic War actually destroyed all that advantage for France. And not only did it, not only was the nation uh, bankrupt, but the class of people who had money to invest that you had in Britain and the U.S. who were investing in factories, willing to invest in, in the occupations of the working class and the middle classes, uh, that class in France just separated themselves from, those, from the rest of France. Up until the mid-century, they refused to invest in the industrial basis of the, of the <laughs> French economy. So France fell behind. It, 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 was a, it took about a century for it to really rise again. You know, after the, uh, about the time of the American Civil War, they were finally getting up there again. But it was, it was a disastrous occurrence. So it was a social difficulty. Yeah. Up until uh, what year was that model of French musket used? Uh, this model was copied by the Americans starting in 1794 and basically used up to about 1815. Uh, the improved one that the French had in 1777, we copied for uh, model 1816. So you see, we're like behind the eight ball, but the basic flintlock musket of this sort is used right up to the Civil War. So you find some of them being used. There's a picture of this one gent at the Battle of Gettysburg, if you ever you call him, he's sitting there with his beard and he's got a musket in the background sit in a rocking chair, and he was one of the civilians, older civilians who went out as a war of 1812 one. You look in the background and it's one of those. You know, wasn't that old then. And this is, um, this is a French style reproduction that I'm mounting in a gun. It's a trade gun, but it's a basic French style. It has a flat spring, and uh, if you can shut the lights off, I'll spark it. So you can see, okay, so it has, this is a French uh, spring-loaded cover, it has safety now. Let me see. See that? So it's a, quite the shower of sparks goes right on the gunpowder. Okay, so it's, you can put the light back on for a moment. Okay, so it's going to fire pretty good. Pretty determined, pretty fast. All right, so let me get my pointer. All right, so we're all set to go. Uh, thank you. You can shut it off now. Let me see if I can get this. And a, a war of independence. So this is just set in the background. Um, and of course, we, have, we know that Jason Hassel, uh, his, uh, he, they were active at Bunker Hill. Bunker Hill was a, a huge defeat for the Continental Army. Uh, it's sometimes you do find people thinking it was a great victory. It was a terrific victory, if you might say. Uh, down here you have, of course, the, the little notice, the recruiting notice. Uh, up on the left is a, is a uh, Max, uh, Maxwell. He's from uh, Charlemont, the officer from Charlemont, Mac Maxwell, Hugh Maxwell. Yeah, and that's a profile of him. And... Um, is that, okay, so let's see if we can, okay, well, let's switch it on. All right, so here we have a few modern impressions, these paintings. Um, so this is an heirloom in the possession of the Hassel family. This French model 1768 musket is understood to have been used by Jason Hassel, 1748 to 99. He served in Captain Joseph Moore's company of Colonel William Prescott's regiment at Bunker Hill in the siege of Boston in 1775. Prescott was a remarkable commander. Even the British noticed him from across the river up there. He was so active on the ramparts. And he's the one who 
it is quoted as, don't shoot till you see the whites of their eyes. Don't fire to, which actually was uh, said a lot with commanders at that time. That was sort of the normal thing, was to not shoot till you get that close. Because then your blow is, such, is, is much heavier. And you have a, uh, an impression here of the siege of Boston from Dorchester Heights, which basically drives the British out of Boston. Uh, the one on the right is by Don Triani. Part of the scene there is the British finally break through the battlements. The Bunker Hill Monument was my earliest memory as a little kid. I, it was about 100 yards from my house. So I would wander up there as a little kid and feel the stone and, and, uh, and work around and such like that. Next, please. By the time Jason Hassel, by, at the time he was likely carrying a British musket or American-made copy, uh, as you, in the hands here, of this, uh, the image of the modern image of the soldier on the left, Don Triani. Uh, it's very, it's identical to the one, or very similar to the one that I showed you uh, from Pete Thomas's collection. And the one in the upper right, the actual gun in the collection of the Springfield Armory, is an American made copy, uh, essentially identical, just made in cherry. Next, please. So John Hassel's service record in Colonel Moses Nichols' regiment of volunteers. Now this is a few years later. Uh, New Hampshire joined the Continental Army in Rhode Island in August 1778 and discharged on the 27th. At this time he was a corporal, and that's what the record on the left says. If you look at it, if you can see it closely with with uh, more contrast, it's um, it it says how much he's being reimbursed. And uh, at this time, he was likely issued the French Charleville musket. And now, the image on the right is something new. That's, that's a, a phenomenal discovery of, um, that's just occurred this past April, last month. And they're now in the possession of the Museum of the American Revolution. But it was found in Philadelphia in a, in a family collection, several drawings by this Swiss artist who they know was doing drawings and they just haven't seen his drawings to speak of. And he actually drew the Continental Army as they're passing through Philadelphia. So this is an image here. And I want to spend just a moment here. If you have any questions, have any idea you like, just let me know. So this image here. So this is the North Carolina Brigade of the Continental Army passing through Philadelphia in August 1777. So this is the year before Hassel's New Hampshire regiment goes to Rhode Island. And uh, so you have here uh, a wagon being pulled, two horses, a rider here, uh, two women up here with a baby, some package, a man here. Looks like an officer on horseback or a non commissioned officer, perhaps, right here. Uh, here is an infantryman. Probably no different from Hassel, classic battalion infantryman with his cock hat off to the side. You, you turned your tricorned hat slightly askew so the musket barrel did not hit it. And, uh, when you, and here was a remarkable portrayal of a rifleman, <laughs> actually done at the time. And uh, he has wearing a fringed coat of linen or cotton and a wool. And uh, he's barefoot, he's, and he has a rifle as opposed to a musket. And he has a, a cap, uh, the little cap like the light infantry used. And he looks, in the picture, he looks like he's smiling at the, at the artist as he goes by. So it's just a glimpse of the kind of what it is when a regiment moves. When, it, when a regiment would move, it's not just the men. For the militia going to conquer, maybe... And seven, in April 19th, from here, you would, you, there wouldn't just be the men. In every case, you might have some women, even kids with them. But when a regiment is moving here in the 18th century fashion, whether it's British, French, whatever, it's essentially a family affair. You're looking at a moving village. Mm -hmm.
Yes. What's the difference between a rifle and a musket? Yeah, good question. I was waiting for that. Thank you, Marge. I did, I did not plant Marge for that purpose. Um, the rifle is, most people think of a long arm today, a long arm being something you put to your shoulder and shoot. And um, they would say a rifle. It's a very hard habit to get out of, but the difference between a shotgun and a rifle is that the shotgun is a, just a smooth tube. And a rifle is a, is a smooth tube, but it has scribed uh, into the barrel, into that inner surface, um, cut a cut of uh, like a channel, channels, maybe a half dozen, maybe 12, maybe five, maybe more, of, uh, which all go parallel to each other, but in a spiral. And what that attempts to do is if you can get your projectile to somehow grab those grooves, it's going to take a spin like a train on a railroad track. It's going to follow the track. And it's going to continue to spin after it comes out. So it's, it's like the way an American football is thrown. It's thrown for accuracy. So you can go end to end, it'll stay stable. If you just push it like a basketball, an American football, it's going to tumble. And that's what's going to happen if you don't have the ball spinning. But that allows, the ball doesn't go any further than a wood with a smooth bore, but it's going to go with more accuracy. So it means, it means that you can hit what you aim at at a much greater distance. That's the difference. Anybody get that? Yeah. Ta -da. You, nobody's going to be tested on this. It's okay. <laughs> but uh, when you have modern guns have what they call breech loading, so that the, the bullet actually is a little bigger than the, than the interior bore of the barrel, just slightly. And what happens is that the soft metal is forced to distort and conform to the grooves, and that grabs it and it will spin it. Whereas in earlier times, when you loaded from the muzzle, the ball would also be undersized, but you'd wrap it in cloth or maybe thin leather. Usually you would have a bit of grease or fat with it, something to lubricate it. Um, maybe olive oil, actually olive oil was the big oil used on these guns anyway. Um, so that's the difference, a rifle. Uh, you have accounts from the British during the um, Battle of Brandywine where the Americans are uh, hitting their mark at 250 yards or more, sometimes 400 yards, uh, 600 yards is a third of a mile. So it's a remarkable shooting for some, you know, but that's practice and practice and practice. And many of these were Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia uh, men who lived in the backwoods, especially. So they lived by the rifle. It's kind of become a great part of the American myth. Rifles were actually not that common in the American Army. They were mostly used for sniping work. And as the war went on, you see le fewer and fewer rifle and rifles being used. And Washington begins to convert the rifle regiments from those units into musket regiments. He takes away the rifles and gives them muskets because they're more useful in the battlefield because the battles are fought in European fashion. The British also have riflemen. So it's, it's not unique to the Americans, it's just to make that clear. So it, in fact, by the time the war's over, Washington in his writings totally disgusted with the riflemen. You know, you look at, you look at this guy, you know, he's, uh, he's there with his bare feet and no pack, you know. Someone else is carrying his stuff and he's barefoot. And he's smiling, <laughs> you know, so um, that they, in the siege of Boston, the riflemen were notoriously undisciplined, good shots. And in fact, the numbers of them actually joined the British. They went over. It's not talked about much, but the British mentioned it quite a bit. That's, that's where a hot shot. Um, hot shot was a different thing. That's an artillery, naval thing, but you could say that, yeah. But yeah, you might say, yeah, someone who's a hot shot would be someone who is... Um, a good shot or the hot shot is actually when you would heat the cannonball up in an oven and get it really hot, red hot, and you'd shoot it at the enemy ship and it would land on the ship and set a fire. So that's a hot shot. I have a question. Do I see correctly in his record that the pay was um, monthly five and a half dollars up per month and yeah. then ammo wages for oh, you can have, Yeah, you can read that this close, but um, it's, yeah. So, uh, so was he supposed to live on $5.5 a month? Um, well, he's got other stuff taken care of. No, he's not supposed to. The food's being supplied. The shelter's being supplied. 
Yeah, they're not living independently. I wonder why we have that yellow cast to this. Maybe it's, yeah. Anyway, it is what it is. All right. We, so we'll go. So these are, um, this is a bit of Springfield Armories. These are the three volumes. They look like ledges from that I told you about. Uh, this is the periods in which they cover. Uh, early 1778, so some gaps uh, to early 1780. And by 1780, they're moving the operation down south and eventually ends up at Yorktown. So uh, these are what it says here, Springfield Laboratory and uh, Springfield here. These are, so, so next one, next please. Uh, this is the only example I'll show you. So here's your p typical page, one page is another. You can see you got days of the week, total produced, each one produced. The names of the people, the people in charge, uh, and the summation down here, in this case for this week is 21,126 musket cartridges. And about 30% of them were, were not just one lead ball, but they'd have the lead, big lead ball and three buckshot, or they'd be all buckshot. So the American Army was also supplying, uh, Springfield's also supplying buckshot and what they call buck and ball. And uh, this is, uh, the, these are used by the American Army. It's something the Americans had been using, like the Canadians had been using in the woods uh, for hunting, but also for anti-personnel. Uh, there's an account at the Battle of Princeton where one British, young junior British officer describes that every officer in his unit has been shot, and he's the only one standing, and he's taking his men back, and suddenly in his cross belt appears a bullet hole. But it's a buckshot hole. It's like 30 caliber. And it's at such a distance, it just gets through the leather, but doesn't get through his clothes. He, sa he says, but for a moment, he's like, oh, hell, you know. And, uh, but, he's, but then he's okay. So this just kind of brings it into the local area. So the next one, please. And uh, this is the typical production. You can see it peaking. And you're looking at um, the time when um, Jason Hassel is in is right here. So he's getting the cartridges from the production. But after he's... Uh, the records of him in the Continental Army are done, and he goes back to New Hampshire for his militia duty. You can see this big spiking as the war continues to progress in 1779, uh, leading down to the fight as they head down south then, and it tapers off. Next, please. Uh, so here is um, the Continental Army musket marking starting 1777. U.S. and U. States or United States, we started branding the wood or stamping the metal. See, here it says U. States. This is an American-made copy of the British musket. Uh, here it says United States and U.S. Now, that's being done in Philadelphia. So you don't see that much for guns that never left New England, like, like Jason Hassel's one. Okay, next. Uh, this is... Um, this is a New, New Hampshire one, first New Hampshire, fifth continent, and this is their record early in the war, Saratoga, and their eventually Yorktown. And that unit had specifically, uh, uniquely stamped breech on the top of the left side of the barrel. Uh, NH, here it is, NH1B-N470, that's First New Hampshire Regiment, Company B, musket number 476. And um, that's, uh, that's something which collectors of these weapons look for. But it's, uh, the, these, these guns were all marked after they got off, after they were sent off the boat uh, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. Uh, unfortunately, the text here is hard for you to see. But it, um, this is the one in the uh, Musée de l'Armée. So, it's, it's, it's a gun identical to yours. You see here it's A Arsenal de Chalville, just what yours is. This is what it looked like new. Here's that same sling swivel like the one that I'm passing around. Here is that forward band with the spring. The ramrod's bent up a bit. And here's your same butt. There's your sling swivel. And you can see how clean and gorgeous it's made. It's, it's turned on a lathe. The British at this time and the Americans were doing theirs on grindstones to get the rounding, but the fr French, uh, the British, the Americans and the British later on after the War of Independence, they, you know, we should start using the lathe. The French are doing it, you know. <laughs> and uh, here's your butt plate with the marks. 
You can see the flint has scraped down the face of this, scraping off some of the steel. The sparks come from the steel. The flint is harder than the steel but, and sharper. Maybe two, three dozen shots and you might change the flint or, re, or re-sharpen the edge. But um, this is what you're looking at when it's issued to uh, private ha- or corporal Hassel, rather. He's a corporal by the time we know he's carrying this. And um, any questions on that? Uh, you, your, your gun is virtually complete. It has a replaced mainspring sometime in the 20th century uh, and has a, re- has a reproduction ramrod, but otherwise it's, it's all there. It's, it's gorgeous. It doesn't look as shiny as this, but it's, it's a real thing. Uh, okay, let's just take it on from there. Any questions on anything? See in the meantime. Okay, anything ab- about those brands you see, by the way? Let's just go back to one. With the, okay, these. If you see a small U.S., that's post-war. But uh, this is the... Uh, now, the trouble was that Continental Army was losing guns uh, by uh, the first time at Valley Forge. When, uh, when, when, the, when the winter was about done, the soldiers whose tour of duty was done and they could go home, a lot of times these were their own guns or they were their state guns, and they just went home with them. And suddenly Washington said, oh, I don't look too good, you know. <laughs> uh, so he said, we've got to put a stop to that. You know, they may not be happy about it, but we're going to guns that come into our possession. Even if it's their gun, it's going to be an army gun, period. So we're going to stamp them, and we're going to brand them. And we hope that's as far as the branding went, if you, <laughs> if you displeased them. But it's... Um, and again, that's happening in the Philadelphia arsenal after the British have left. Okay, let's go on. And um, so I have just two more slides. And uh, one is about the memory of the time of these events. And then the next one will be about a kind of just a brief look at some modern memory. Uh, Washington, when he is doing his farewell address, he uses that phrase one, that they are one patriotic band of brothers when he's uh, given a power, you know, commanded a Continental Army on November 2nd, 1783. Um, this is one of my, this is my favorite painting of him, uh, done about just a few years later. He's still a vigorous young man. He's red-haired, and, um, and uh, this is a painting done by a witness at the Battle of Princeton. So you see the Continental Army here, and in ranks here, and here, and you see the, and the here's the British on the fence line in his artillery, uh, mostly French artillery. Uh, and um, any questions on that? This was uh, done by um, a man named Mercer. He was, uh, he was a, I think, an adolescent when he, he was here. His father was killed here. He was an officer. Next, please. Can, I, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, you might have said that. So each town had its own militia company. So yes. would the, the guns be delivered to town, or would they, the soldiers get them at some later point? Uh, it varied. varied. At first, um, well, during the War of Independence, the, there was some supply done from the states. Depends on the state, depends on the unit. Uh, but by and large, you were required from the 1630s on to provide your own gun in good condition, practice with it, have cartridges ready and all the accoutrements like the cartridge box and maybe a blade, or in this case, bayonet, when that, when that became possible. Uh, bayonets come in relatively late for most militia. And, uh, but it, uh, you are basically to be self-contained and to turn out when needed. And you practice uh, once a month for four months in the spring, early summer, and maybe a few months in the fall. You have the summer for, fa- for agricultural uh, pursuits, and you have the winter where you're, you're not going to be training. But you are expected to train as a unit, uh, sometimes shoot at targets. You're going to be inspected. If you are lacking, you pay a fine. That money goes to pay for the weapons and accoutrements for those that can't afford them in your community, but still must stand in ranks. So that's the system, and um, it worked. It worked for a while. Uh, it isn't until after 1808 that the um, federal government starts supplying the militia with muskets. 
That's, they had the 1808 Militia Act, and they produced a whole bunch of cheap muskets. In fact, the, remember the one you saw in Waitley? Yeah. That was one of them, and it was so cheap. It was so cheap that they complained about it. <laughs> you know, it was a copy of a Springfield. Okay, the next one. And it said the modern use of historical memory of French flintlock muskets in the War of Independence. Uh, so the left is an image uh, I took at Springfield uh, Armory today. Uh, these days, uh, they're in one of our uh, ga annual gatherings. And this other one, you, is that a familiar picture, this one here? And yeah, yeah it's uh, mid-20th century, the Continental Insurance Company. Uh -huh. but, you know what he's, but you can see what he's holding. See the springs, all this. It's a model 1768, Charleville. There it is. So there, that's what it's still in the public image. So thank you. Very, any questions now? I will take, maybe you put the lights on if you want. Let's do, well, li yeah, good. Okay, otherwise we can come back to an image.